Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome back to the Atomium. Welcome back to Brussels and happy Europe Day. If you're joining for the first time, I'm Feve and together with Rita and Jean-Marc will be your host for the third and final day of the Dare to Care International Convention. Time flies when you're having fun, right Jean-Marc? Absolutely Feve. And how much fun and work we've had over the last few days. We've discussed everything from migration to communication, art to economics. We had the chance to travel around Europe and the world. I went to local events in the Netherlands, Ireland, the UK, North America and Portugal. There was another interesting event called Who Cares? that brought together Christian young people from across Europe, including Hungary, Romania and Greece. It was super interesting to see the diversity of young people in Europe, especially given today is Europe Day. Here in Belgium, we had a great event on how care can answer to the crisis of today. Michel Dupuis gave us philosophical perspectives to approach crisis to help us find those answers. Other experts shared how they try to live dare to care in the field of politics and local government. There were many Dare to Care events in Belgium this year, so we took time to look back on all the projects that happened in the different local communities for Dare to Care over the last year. I also had the chance to connect to the webinar A Vaccine for All, the Common Good, the World Needs Now. What a powerful message of Dare to Care in this big challenge of our times. Access to the COVID-19 vaccine for everyone around the world is such a tangible and concrete way of living there to care. We call on European leaders here in Brussels and all leaders around the world to truly make COVID-19 vaccines accessible to everyone, no matter where they are. We commit ourselves to continue to push for vaccine access for all and we'll keep you updated on our website and social media in the weeks to come. So today we embark on a new phase of the Dare to Care journey where we strengthen our focus on caring for the environment and the planet. This journey is first and foremost about commitment, taking responsibility, having courage and stepping up to the challenge. It's about caring for our planet. So we asked people on the streets of Brussels what they do to look after our planet. Here's what they said. Yes, I always recycle. If I have to drink water or something, I just fill in the water in the same bottle. I try to don't buy uh, plastics anymore. I, I use a reusable bottle. I, I have a lot of friends comes from Italy that are immigrants and everything, so I always try to feel, to feel them, to let them feel at home. I eat less meat than before. Uh, I try not to to spill food and, and also be respectful towards nature where I put my trash. I try to speak about these issues with my friends. I try to uh, inform myself and inform other people as much as I can. I sold my car. I only move my bike or train or bus. I travel only in Europe now. I didn't take a plane for three years now. I just don't buy anything new. But uh, we can only do so much. And if the big corporations that are responsible for most of the, the, the bigger picture of the problem don't do anything, then we are just sold to having no solutions. Um, so yeah, I do many things. And I try to drift more. Planting trees, taking good care of our planet, because this is where we live, you know. I am definitely trying to stay COVID conscious, taking tests as soon as I can. I got <laughs> sanitizers and stuff for like everyone, some people at the dorm, so I'm trying my best. I sometimes uh, do clean works to, uh, to, uh, to take the, the trash on the, on the ground with my, my friends and uh, with the scouts also. If we don't take good care of this planet, so it's our, in the long run, we pay for this. Yes, and so I participate in manifestation and stuff, and whatever I can do as a, the Colibri effect, I'll do it, but it, yes, I follow the, the I, I hope I follow the right thing for, for the society, yes.
That's what we're talking about. Lots of people in Brussels are committed and enthusiastic about our ecological well-being. We're absolutely not alone making this wave of change bigger and bigger. A campaign like Dare to Care is made of thousands of commitment, individual and true communities. In everything we do, we learn, act and share. As we move to focus on an integral ecology and care for our planet for the year ahead, we will work on five different goals. The first, care to change, care to imagine, care to reset, care to impact, and finally, care to connect. We want this journey to help us live more sustainably, to slow down, imagine and contemplate the beauty of nature, and be more connected to it. Above all, we want this care for the planet to unite us and to bring all of us together. And you will hear more from the teams working on these objectives in the weeks and months ahead. But today we have something to get us started. Let's talk about the Planet Pledge. It's a chance to start this campaign with a commitment that each of us will take care for the next year. You can pledge what you feel up to, and as we move through our program today, we'll be talking to people who have taken these commitments, both on an individual and community level. These are amazing initiatives that can help us celebrate this exciting next stage of our Dare to Care journey. And they can inspire us to take our own commitments. Let's start in Thailand. Ever heard of Lily? She's a 14-year-old climate activist, and you will be blown away by her story. Hi, my name is Lily. As um, an environmental and climate activist, I work with a lot of um, big companies and the government as well to reinforce policies and to basically ban single-use plastics in Thailand. I would say it's, I feel, a responsibility almost to become a climate activist and um, an environmental activist, um, mainly because I see the damage that's been happening to the earth and the urgency of how and what we need to do in order to create change. I think I received the Eunice Youth Award um, a couple of years ago on Social Business Day in Bangkok and I was um, basically created uh, to be an ambassador. Not only um, is it recognizing that I um, as a person have gone out of my way to do all these things in order to create change for the environment and hopefully a better home for myself and the future generations. But it also, um, I yeah, I feel like the recognition is good at times. However, awards don't really win you the health and safety of the environment. Therefore, even though I do have the award now, I still need to push forward and I still need to go because in the end, awards aren't my end goal. I think I started my activism at about eight years old. Um, just small things from talking to uh, cashiers at supermarkets to calling in um, company hotlines to ask them to stop using single-use plastic and just talking to the government small things from not only talking to big change makers but also trying to change myself and my family and the friends and people around me try to trying to spread awareness small change is honestly better than doing nothing at all so i would say do the best you can to cut down on the things that you don't need not only doing things physically uh, using actions like say no to single-use plastics when you're in a store when it's unnecessary and bringing your own reusable bags, bring, bringing your own reusable straws and also change mentally as well. So think about how much you're consuming, what you can do, open your mind, open your heart to um, new things that you can do, be more empathetic and compassionate towards the world and others because in the end a change of mindset is really key in order to change the actions that are currently being taken place over the world. 
At times, I would say it is um, fairly difficult to find hope, uh, especially because everything that you see every single day with um, all the climate emergencies and ice melting in the Arctic to PM 2.5 and forest fires in California. But usually I take like pessimistic emotions and turn it into hope, I guess. I'm part of Fridays for Future. People being engaged with the movement and how it's so widespread all over the world has really given me hope as well. To see that so many young people, to see so many youth and adults as well, having similar mindsets as me in order to demand change from the government and from the world, the world's leaders, in order to demand climate justice. It makes me more positive and more hopeful for the future. Throughout the years that I've done this, it honestly has become kind of a part of my life. And all the progress that I've been doing, and when I think of that, it allows me to be a little bit more motivated not to stop. Lily, thank you and so many young people like you for inspiring us to put care for our planet first. I will join Lily in reducing my own single-use plastic consumption this year and in campaigning for more effective rules from our businesses and our governments. We go from reducing to repairing, to one of the thousands of repair cafes in all over the world. We chat with Chris from the Repair Café in Belfast, a city in Northern Ireland, on the very edge of Europe. You will see, her enthusiasm is contagious. I'm sure some of you will think about starting a repair café or joining one in your city, town or village during this Dare to Care campaign. After Chris, Jen Verde, an international performing arts group and partner of the United World Project, will sing for us Turn Around, a song they made with young people all over the world. Chris, over to you. So my name is Chris uh, McCartney and I live in Belfast in Northern Ireland and I'm involved in a project called the Repair Cafe Belfast. So a Repair Cafe is a pop-up community event where people who have broken items can bring them along and we have volunteers who have skills in fixing things um, and we match them up and we fix a whole lot of stuff um, while sharing a lovely morning together. There's been a lot of um, publicity about recycling and about conservation but one thing we maybe haven't um, tapped the full potential of is the opportunity to reuse resources and repair what we already have because every time we fix something um, we're keeping it going and we're um, avoiding all that kind of extraction and all the resources that would go into making something new to replace it in the first place. So I just put the put a shout out on social media to ask if anybody had heard of this idea of a repair cafe and if anybody would like to get involved in setting one up here in Northern Ireland. Um, and all these people came out of the woodwork, people I had never met before um, and complete strangers. And in about 10 weeks time, we pulled together our very first event. Uh, it was a wonderful morning. We had never, none of us, about 20 people came and volunteered that first day. None of us had ever set foot in a repair cafe before, though there are repair cafes all over the world, but there were, had never been one in Northern Ireland for us to go along and see it. Um, it was two weeks before Christmas. It, the snow and ice came that weekend and we thought nobody would come. But um, lots of people came and we fixed 43 things that first morning. Somebody brought this toaster down and he had tried to fix it himself. He had taken it apart and not been able to fix it and not been able to get it back together. So we arrived with this toaster in parts and one of our fixers um, got, you know, got working on it and we managed to get it. He felt that it was fixed and we, we tried it. We got, he got it put back together again. And he said, if only we had a piece of toast, we, a piece of bread, we could try this out. So somebody said, ha, we'll go to the kitchen. We had prepared lunch for the volunteers. So we had a, had a slice of bread we were able to rustle up. And they put the bread in the toaster and this group of people gathered around to watch. And the excitement and the sense of emotional involvement in this toaster working was just palpable, you know. And then after a minute, the toaster popped, the toast popped and the toast was cooked. And it was, again, just that kind of 
really physical and, and, and tangible and touchable sense that something had changed and something had been fixed is really a lovely thing and I think something that people are looking for and we discovered that it was more than just fixing items it was actually there was a really special atmosphere and bringing people together to kind of solve problems and help each other and share their skills um, it felt really uplifting and people were hooked and uh, we have gone from strength to strength since then. It's not just getting something fixed, it's not just kind of something ticked off a to-do list, it's a really joyful process and the sense that um, restoring something um, physical can actually be quite restorative to, to yourself and, and to our community as well because we're creating these spaces where people can come and be welcome. Think of a time just before um, the lockdown that we were able to get together and celebrate with our volunteer team and we had a had a, a little pizza party and um, we kind of just celebrated having um, looked at our first 1000 items um, and, and tried to fix tried to fix them and um, we just we just thought it would be kind of uh, marking the occasion and, and talking about you know all the all the wonderful things we'd fixed and the wonderful events we'd done in the park and a thank you to our partners but it actually became this really um, deep sharing about how much the repair cafe means to people and um, I'm not going to lie there were tears and there was poetry and there were people the one woman said um, that she you know hadn't suited her to come that night but she'd rearranged her week so that she could because that's how important it was to her um, and she was a, a church goer herself and she said she had never found unity like she found within the repair cafe community um, and you know another another person shared that you know she wasn't uh, a church before, but this kind of was her church this sort of sense of community and this sense of being able to help each other restore not just our items but our relationships and our selves and and to kind of really uplift each other um so just kind of realizing that what we thought was a project that was really about fixing things and maybe um, making a contribution to to kind of you know tackle consumption and and um, and climate change, actually um, was really about relationships and about um, community and, and bringing people together. in his eyes he said out there i learned a lot something changes inside when you see the earth rise got no boundaries and no walls that living breathing ball love is underneath it all
What a powerful message there from Jem Verde. They are absolutely right. This is the time to turn around, to do our part to care for the planet and stop it from slipping further into climate catastrophe. Now we go to the Philippines to Nicole Ann from the I Am Climate Justice Movement. Nicole is part of a team of students, activists, artists and high profile lawyers. They seek climate justice by pressurizing governments to protect future generations from the climate crisis. Hi, I am Nicole Ann Ponce. I am from the Philippines. I am the regional coordinator for I Am Climate Justice Movement, which is now part of the umbrella organization called World Youth for Climate Justice. What we're trying to do, um, us in the World Youth for Climate Justice, is quite unique in the sense that we're not just advocating in general terms, although we're always asking, calling to action, um, for sustainability, for protection of the environment. But the main gist of our campaign is that we're seeking an advisory opinion from the World Court, which is the International Court of Justice in Hague, Netherlands. So we're actually trying to campaign for an actual document that serves great authority and moral weight from all governments in the world. This will involve the obligations of states, especially um, in the face of the climate crisis. Although there's an umbrella organization, the World Youth for Climate Justice, um, we want each individual from their different regions or countries to take ownership over the campaign. On my end, for example, um, how I contribute and um, to the campaign in general is um, under the I Am Climate Justice movement, where we have organized activities such as the food gardens movement. So this is important to address because food has been a great, a very serious issue uh, in my country, especially because of um, climate change in general and the whole climate crisis. We are very vulnerable to it. The fact that we are, we are visited by several typhoons in a year which destroys much of our crops and um, even houses in general so this only worsens the issue on the climate crisis only worsens the inequalities in my country so the poor just become poorer and right now due to the global pandemic so many people are left hungry in my country so that's why we started the Food Gardens Movement, which is a call to action from our government as well to a lot of community gardens um, in each region of the Philippines, in each province, so that there's a dedicated community garden. And the idea is if you have a garden, then nobody will go hungry. In the movement, we have the concept of uh, climate justice and intergenerational responsibility. So even if people right now or in different parts of the world don't feel the urgency because of where they are situated, um, I ask you, I ask everyone to think about their future children or think about their niece or think about their younger sisters and brothers. And I think that's enough reason for them to take action or to really care. Because if we don't do anything right now, we will leave them with a world that will be inhab inhabitable. The whole issue of climate crisis cannot be solved by people um, who are only affected by it. We need every single person to dare to care. If we want to reach as much people as possible, then we really need to make use of social media. And although it has some bad aspects to it, I would like to focus on the good that it does as well. My message for everyone that is watching right now is that don't ever think that any, don't ever think that you are small or your actions are small because you are important and every one of us uh, is important, has an important role to play in this world, especially in our fight 
against the climate crisis. No act is too small or too insignificant in this fight. Um, what's important is that when we, the moment we dare to care about the world, that's the moment we start making a difference. Thank you, Nicole Ann, for your hard work and activism. As a law graduate, I'm also fascinated by how you have used the law as a tool to care for our planet. Seems like we need to catch up soon. Making farming regenerative and sustainable is a key challenge that many countries around the world face. Getting this right is a powerful way of caring for our planet. Mateusz, a farmer from Poland is helping the COP26 climate change conference think about ways we can make farming more sustainable. For over a year, he has been working with the Economy of Francesca network of economists, entrepreneurs and change makers to build a more sustainable and caring economy. We asked Mateusz to tell us more about this challenge of sustainable agriculture and how we can all get involved in supporting this in the year ahead. Let's listen. Hi everyone, my name is Mateusz Czesnocha and I am a farmer from Poland. Basically, my day is a mixture of working outside, uh, which is less than what I would wish to be doing right now, and a lot of uh, online activities because of the coronavirus times that we are in uh, right now. From my perspective, it is necessary to be engaging uh, with this sector at, at numerous levels. That's why I've started uh, by saying, hey, I am a farmer, like I am a farmer in a particular location of the world, which is very local. And at the same time, I'm super privileged to be working at both European and, and global levels um, in order to a comprehensively understand those topics and then be able to change or together with people that I'm working with, try changing those systems. Which leads me to, to telling you more a little bit about uh, COP26, Conference of the Parties, or the 26th meeting of the Conference of the Parties, which is um, a, an institution under the UN United Nations, Nations structure in which uh, parties, meaning by parties we understand the member states, are coming together to discuss uh, a very important issue. And that issue in case of COP26 is, of course, climate, which we know uh, is changing and that human-induced activities are contributing to um, to this climate change uh, going forward. Uh, that's why the parties, the member states, are meeting uh, usually annually, they didn't meet last year because of COVID, to uh, review the latest state of knowledge or state of science in the topic of climate change and uh, propose solutions on uh, how we should be moving forward as a global community uh, in order to be both mitigating and adapting to climate change, which is real. And of course, you may, you may know, I hope you know, about the Paris Agreement, um, which has been signed at one of those conference of the parties uh, that says we have to limit our uh, emissions, uh, greenhouse gas emissions to, to net zero by 2050, if we want to achieve um, uh, global warming increases of 1.5 degrees uh, above uh, pre-industrial times. So I care for the planet first and foremost because I can. I am in an extremely privileged position to be able to make a difference uh, to the way uh, the landscape I am managing as a farmer in Northern Poland is being managed and with those other activities at European and, and global levels, how certain frameworks in which the whole industry operates are also being created and implemented. And I would like to share two other thoughts in this point. You can care uh, and you can dare to care. 
uh, it is the choice you are making. And as I've said, I understand totally uh, that sometimes it's super hard, but you have that choice. There's no caring for people without caring for planet and vice versa. Uh, you have to do both simultaneously. If you are compromising on one of those, then something is not right. And we are also seeing that, you know, as, as farmers, if you are making money, negatively contributing to the environment, this is not sustainable. At the same time, if you are only caring about the environment without providing for your family, that's not sustainable either. Good agriculture, regenerative agriculture, goes hand in hand with each other, meaning like the human and environmental component are super connected and they go hand in hand. Uh, my single biggest piece of advice, talk to your farmer. Find a farmer near you and talk with her or him. And I'm sure that experience will be enriching for both of you. My second piece of advice, more on the commercial side, would be buy local. If you have a choice between buying something that is produced thousands of kilometers away versus something that is produced locally, Thank you, Mateusz. As someone who loves to cook, I'm going to make my commitment right now to buying more locally and buying sustainably in the year ahead. Good luck at COP26, and we hope to catch up with you again later in our Dare to Care campaign. From Poland, we go to Burkina Faso to meet Jean Bernard and some of the team from the Greening Africa Together Network. This network is a partner of the United World Project and is supported by our promoters, New Humanity NGO. The network aims to fight climate change, reduce carbon footprint, support green developments, and bridge cultural, religious, and social borders. It's present in seven African nations, Benin, Cameroon, Democratic Republic of Congo, Kenya, Senegal, Uganda, and Burkina Faso. It is there where we catch up with Jean-Bernard, Miriam, and the students who installed sustainable energy sources in a middle school there. Let's learn more about it. Je suis Noraoro Jean-Bernard Sawaro. Nous avons eu l'occasion à à Rome de rencontrer Lily qui avait créé le projet Greening Africa Together. Euh, ce projet a pour ambition de réverdir l'Afrique ensemble. Dans ce sens, nous avons soumis à, à, à Greening Africa Together trois projets depuis 2018. Le premier projet a consisté en l'électrification d'un Euh, lycée polytechnique en milieu rural au Burkina Faso. Le deuxième projet, c'est un projet de reforestation euh, dans un village au centre du Burkina, euh, à quelques 40 km de Ouagadougou. Et le troisième projet, c'est euh, le recyclage des déchets plastiques. Et si je prends le projet d'éclairage du lycée polytechnique de Farakoba, Il a consisté à ce qu'un groupe d'étudiants du Burkina et de l'Université de Berlin travaillent sur le projet à partir du schéma de l'école qui a huit classes et trois bureaux d'administration pour définir la quantité de plaques solaires, la quantité de câbles, la quantité de batteries et leur qualité pour pouvoir éclairer et ventiler les salles de classe. Environ 60% des écoles et des lycées du Burkina ne sont pas éclairés. Il en est de même pour les dispensaires et les centres de santé populaires. Avec cette politique d'électrification par photovoltaïque, nous sommes en train de créer des centrales autonomes. Et ce projet-là, euh, si nous avons les moyens, on va pouvoir soulager les malades dans les centres de santé et dans les dispensaires et nous améliorer les conditions de travail, d'études des, des enseignants et des élèves en milieu rural. Euh, ce projet, c'est dans le sens, dans le, ça rentre dans les objectifs de Greening Africa Together, 
parce que électrifier avec l'électricité conventionnelle suppose augmenter la production de CO2, donc la pollution de l'environnement. Alors, le projet de forestation rentre dans le même sens, mais avec une spécificité, une nouveauté, parce que chez nous, on a l'habitude de mener des campagnes de reboisement où on plante les arbres et parfois on ne les entretient pas. Notre démarche a consisté à aller voir les paysans du village de Pangouin pour leur faire la proposition. Ils ont dit qu'ils veulent bien planter des arbres, mais ils n'ont pas les moyens. Nous avons dit, si vous êtes d'accord pour planter, et quand vous allez planter, vous allez entretenir, nous allons vous fournir les plants et les, de quoi les protéger. On est tombé d'accord et nous avons demandé à chacun quelles sont les espèces d'arbres qu'il veut, en privilégiant les arbres à essence médicinale, alimentaire et fourragère. Voilà. Et ils ont pu définir leurs besoins. Nous sommes en train de mener une campagne de fundraising pour avoir les moyens et payer les arbres, aller les accompagner pour la plantation. Et chacun, selon le nombre d'arbres qu'il a décidé de prendre, s'est engagé à les entretenir pour qu'ils ne meurent pas. Alors, le troisième projet, c'est un projet de recyclage de déchets plastiques. Ici, nous rejetons dans notre, sur le sol multiples sachets à usage unique, multiples euh, bidons d'eau, de sorte que euh, si rien n'est fait, bientôt notre sol ici sera tapissé. Euh, il a comme conséquence d'appauvrir les sols de, de culture. Et les animaux, pendant la période de divagation, quand ils mangent ces sachets-là, ils meurent avec toutes les conséquences que ça a. Si l'un ou l'autre est prêt à adhérer à notre euh, choix, notre politique euh, de, 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 de re, reverdir l'Afrique ensemble, vous et nous, voilà, ils pourront, euh, même si de loin c'est possible de nous donner une contribution pour qu'on puisse le faire, ce serait une bonne chose. Thank you to all the Greening Africa Together team in Burkina Faso. Go to their website to support their projects. From the 23rd until the 25th of June, the Greening Africa Together Network will be hosting the CO2 Compensation Certificate Conference online. More details are available on the United World Project website. From Burkina Faso, we cross the Atlantic one last time to the Amazon region, to the small country of Guyana. Joel is an economist who is working with indigenous communities in the Amazon. These are some of the communities most affected by the impacts of climate change. Joel tells how he collaborates with the indigenous communities in the mutual trust. Hello everyone, my name is Joel Thompson and I'm a Jesuit from Guyana. For the last three years, I've been working with indigenous peoples in Jesuit mission of Guyana in a place called St. Ignatius. Most of our work initially began with pastoral work, but from speaking with people, we realized that there was a deeper need. And some of those needs are um, in terms of education, and most recently in terms of the environment. My work has involved working with young people in Guyana, and it's really empowering them and informing them about environmental issues. Uh, but in many ways, I've been the one, I've been learning from them rather than the other way around. Uh, they have taught me a bit about what ecology truly means and what it means to care for our common home. The indigenous peoples have been teaching me that the earth is a gift. And they've also been teaching me that other people are gifts. In my work with them, I listen to their struggles. Many people share that they're very sad. They're very disappointed in what's happening to the earth because of illegal mining, many mining companies coming in. And wherever there's mining, of course, as many of you know, 
many human rights issues and abuses. Some projects that we have going, um, one is the Quality Bilingual Education Project and that's happening in three villages. And that is geared towards helping young children between age uh, three to five to learn and to grasp the world through their mother tongue. So not moving into English right away. And that's very important for ecology because language captures a worldview. And if children are disconnected from their language at a very young age, then they're disconnected from a culture and disconnected from their worldview. Um, other projects that we have going include um, just visiting the villages and helping the young people to reflect on Laudato Si. It's quite a big document, you know, six years old by now. It's helping them to appreciate what's happening in the world and the part that they can play as guardians of the forest. So I think there's very much um, that we can learn from Indigenous peoples. Um, so the first, I would say, is just this whole notion of uh, gift, abundance, and also gratitude. And there's also a sense of respect for the environment. So if you've ever spoken to an Indigenous person, one thing they will tell you is that before you go to a new place or before you go to a waterfall or if you want to even take a rock away, you always ask permission from that place, from the gardens of that place, to be there and to state your intention that you intend no harm. Globalization is good, but it means that we have put um, many times a Western model before other cultures, and we have forced them to try to adapt to that model. But we focused on young people because we want them to retain their identity. Many of them share that they feel torn between their culture and their language, and between being part of the new world. But you can have both. You know, it's always both, and you can have culture, and you can have well-being. So I'm you know, daring to care because I want the same for others. I've experienced the beauty of nature, the beauty of uh, a unique culture, and I want others to have that experience. Well, I'd encourage you to do several things, but one practical purpose for those in the North America, those in the West, would be to consume less meat. And why is that so? Because many of the areas in the world, and especially this is in South America, um, they're used for cattle ranching or done so illegally on indigenous lands. So I think that is often driven by a demand, of course, in other countries. So if you'd like to be in solidarity with indigenous peoples, I'd encourage you to not eat meat 24 seven. So you know, every day of the week, so reduce meat consumption, get to love nature, get to spend more time outdoors, get to care. It's very hard to work for something that you don't care for or that you don't love. So I think love is very important. Fall in love with the butterflies and with the roses, then you'll be motivated to do something. That's a good question. Yeah, I, I think everyone can change uh, what they do. I think there's always something that you need to change in your life. I think I, I should um, buy less uh, fast fashion. I should try to buy uh, uh, vintage clothes or use a platform like Vinted. Like for example, you go to Car Carrefour and you want to buy some, some bread or something, it comes in a bag. Buying uh, vegetables that are seasoned or not buying, uh, not eating a lot of uh, uh, meat and um, being careful, yes, and yes, whatever it is for the climate change, of course, so recycling and stuff and using less... Uh, I have families abroad, so I need to, to take the, the, the plane, but I still try to do the best I can to use less means of transportation, go by foot, on, on, on bicycle, those stuff. I try to, you know, I don't buy too much clothes, I'm not, I'm not so materialistic, so I don't, I don't see one thing which I really would change right now. I think I'm just trying uh, through my work and through daily life yeah, to, to be uh, 
to act according to my principles and my values. Maybe biologic uh, things, bio, and uh, no plastic. And uh, I think I'm, I'm gonna try this uh, when I uh, when I'm gonna be uh, a dad or I don't know. We've traveled the world to launch this new phase of the Dare to Care campaign. We have heard of commitments and actions from all corners of the world and even the streets here in Brussels. We visited communities most affected by the impacts of climate change. And we have seen the need to care for our planet now. The urgency of taking our responsibility in this moment is clear. We invite you to join all of these amazing people over the next year to commit to care for the planet, for nature, for our countryside. This campaign continues straight after our live stream. A group of teenagers from Italy will help us turn these commitments into action. That's coming up on our YouTube channels. Then we will have a discussion on CARE and COP26, the upcoming climate change conference which will take place in November with activists and diplomats exploring how CARE can make a difference at this important summit. Finally, for today, we'll have the launch of the Accessible Environments Inclusive Societies project, which is being launched as part of our campaign. But have we forgotten something? Oh yes, what are our planet pledges going to be for the next year? Personally, I want to save food from being wasted. And you, Rita? I pledge to be more mindful about my electricity consumption. Hmm. And I pledge to use more often a reusable coffee cup. Great. And if you visit this website for the United World Project, you can join us too. Give us your name, your country and your pledge, whatever you want to make. And you can join us too. A little tree will be planted on our virtual map to mark your commitment. On that web page, you can add your events, initiatives and projects to keep this. Hashtag Dare to Care campaign going. All that's left for us to say is thank you. Thank you for joining us for the last three days. We look forward to seeing you again soon online or in person. Let's live this Dare to Care commitment for the planet in these days, weeks and months ahead. Let's do it together from the Atomium here in Brussels to wherever you are. Take care, keep safe, and let's dare to care for our planet together. I pledge to continue to use bar soap. I believe graag dit jaar meer tweedehands spullen te kopen, met name kleding. Me comprometo a usar el agua con mayor responsabilidad. I pledge to eat less meat and to support local businesses more. And I pledge to bank more sustainably. Recoger la spazzatura. Durante le mie passeggiate, aiuto a guidare le mie cavolette in Mahalia. Mi protegge le tanche, mi public transport, mi scorrono in acqua, mi ricordo di Mi comprometto a regar con el agua de la lluvia. We pledge to work together with local organizations to pick up and recycle the litter in our local area. I am I'm going to pledge to use less single use plastics this year. I believe Zorg TV me for the nature. We pledge to plant trees and to use the car less. I'm engaged to plant des arbustes. I pledge to plant more pollinator-friendly plants, sustainable in my environment, to help increase our little bumblebee friends. On shepherd geta, ye akke varsak, on nove kapre geuchina. And in Mother Shepherd, our Raktin. I set me in om meer te voet te gaan en de auto minder te gebruiken. Ja, mijn peño in reciclar melhor todo meu lixo. Ik heb me voelde om naar wat zo goed te je om ook te dachten naar mij. Ik me comprometo a reciclar la basura. Ik me engage a manger moins de viande. So we will use public transport where we can walk or use a bike, which I now have for the first time in about 25 years, so cheerio! I would like to pledge for the planet the three R's, reuse, reduce and recycle. And I would like to invite all of you to do the same thing. Will you?